So we'll go ahead and talk about nephrolithiasis in this talk. So nephrolithiasis or kidney stones is something that you're going to see commonly in the ED. Uh, this is excruciating pain and this is going to uh, not be the kind of pain that somebody waits and goes into the clinic. This is going to be the kind of pain that somebody uh, gets a very quick ride to the emergency department by a family member or God forbid themselves. This is a presence of a solid crystal material anywhere uh, from the nephrons uh, down, all the way down to the distal urinary tract. Um, in fact, most kidney stones pass. Uh, a lot of kidney stones are so small that you don't even realize them, but of course when it's clinically significant is going to be when the patient has significant pain, and in that case the kidney stone is usually entrapped somewhere. There are various different types of stones, however the clinical presentation and the workup are all going to be the same. Uh, based on the patient's clinical history, however, you may have some hints as to what kind of stone it is. Ultimately, however, it doesn't really matter because the treatment is going to be the same. However, when you get, uh, when you get the urinalysis and you do see a certain type of stone, that may hint you towards maybe an underlying cause. The presenting symptoms are going to be excruciating flank pain. Most patients, unless they have a very high pain tolerance, most patients are going to describe this pain as a 10 out of 10. This pain characteristically radiates to the groin, so very important not to just have the patient point to where it hurts, but to also ask them if the pain radiates anywhere else. Uh, you may see gross hematuria with a urinalysis, however that's not necessary, but there should be some level of red blood cells uh, in, the, uh, in the urinalysis. Any flank pain that radiates to the groin deserves a stone workup. Now the first step is always going to be pain medication. Kidney stones are not life-threatening, so the very first thing we want to do, of course we always check vitals, but the very first thing we want to do is get the patient under some kind of pain control. The most important labs are going to be a spiral CT to look for the actual stone and also to, uh, to determine where it is, how big it is. Also to get a urinalysis, as I've alluded to earlier, pH is going to help you determine what kind of stone it is, or at least it'll give you some hints. You want to look for red blood cells, you should see some, and then also a urinary calcium. A CMP is going to be important as well, as we're going to see some of these stones develop in, uh, in consort with a hypercalcemia, so we should be mindful of hyperparathyroidism as a possible precipitating cause. Stones that are under 5 millimeters can pass on their own. You just keep the patient uh, with some pain meds and wait for the stones to pass. You should definitely strain the urine while they're passing the stone. Every time they get up to pee, strain the urine so you can see the stones. Differential diagnosis for flank pain includes anything that, uh, well, anything that gives you flank pain can be uh, possibly pile. Pi We're going to go ahead and talk about nephrolithiasis here, and nephrolithiasis is the presence of a solid crystal material anywhere from the nephrons to the distal urinary tract. So nephrolithiasis, in other words, is kidney stones. And this is going to be something that you see somewhat commonly in the ED because these patients are in excruciating pain. These patients do not wait to go into the clinic. It's not like you, know, you have a patient walk into the clinic and they're talking about their pain and, oh, it's kidney stones. No, these patients are in so much pain that they're going to get somebody to drive them into the ED. If not, they'll drive themselves into the ED. But they're in extreme pain, so they're not going to wait to see a doctor about this. Now, there are various different types of stones, and that's going to be important as far as determining if there's some kind of underlying cause behind the stone that's significant and warrants working up. But the presentation and workup for the stone itself is going to be the same. So the presenting symptoms are an excruciating flank pain. This pain the patient will generally rate as a 10 out of 10. It radiates to the groin. So it's never a good idea, unless you're working with a small child, uh, to ask the patient 
to point to where it feels, you want to ask them, where is the pain the worst and does it radiate? Because that gives you a better idea of, uh, of what's causing the pain or, or if there's any kind of uh, referred pain. Uh, but in this case, the pain will radiate. So not only will you have flank pain, but it will radiate to the groin. Uh, a lot of times if you ask men, they'll say it radiates down through their genitals. Uh, there may be gross hematuria, but that is typically rare. Uh, usually it'll be a microhematuria. Any flank pain that radiates to the groin will deserve a stone workup. And that stone workup is going to include a spiral CT to look for the actual stone, a urinalysis. You want to look at the pH. That will help you uh, gather what the possible uh, etiology might be. You want to look for red blood cells, as mentioned, and then also the urinary calcium. You want to get a complete metabolic profile, including calcium, because a hypercalcemia can point you off towards possible hyperparathyroidism. And hypercalcemia is indeed the number one cause, the most common cause of nephrolithiasis in adults. Very important also to get the patient on pain medication. We prefer to give the patient Ketorolac, uh, but any kind of pain medication is fine, uh, and that's really going to be your first step because nephrolithiasis is not a life-threatening condition, so you just make sure the patient is vitally stable. They should be vitally stable when it's nephrolithiasis, and then your very first step is going to give them pain medication before you even start any kind of workup. Anytime a patient is in excruciating pain, provided they're vitally stable, you want to treat their pain. You, can, you want to be a nice doctor, right? Okay, so spiral CT, urinalysis, CMP. That's going to be your, your, your workup. And the spiral CT is important to look for the actual stone. Now, you might ask, why don't we do x-rays? There are a lot of stones that are, that are not going to show up on x-ray. Plus, the stones can be pretty small, and it's easy to miss them. So a spiral CT is just a lot better for visualizing the stone, seeing where it is, and determining what the size is. If the stone is less than five millimeters, the patient can pass it on their own. They're not gonna require shock wave lithotripsy. Um, they can pass it on their own. You just wanna make sure that when they're peeing that the urine is being strained so you can look for the stone. The differential for flank pain, you wanna keep this in mind. When a patient has flank pain, perhaps it's not a stone. Uh, so in addition to uh, nephrolithiasis, it could also be pyonephrosis. Uh, so in that case, the patient will typically have a fever. Acute appendicitis, you can pick this up on CT, just like pyonephrosis. Uh, and then urethritis. In the case of urethritis, uh, usually they'll have, uh, the, the pain will be more uh, focused in the genital area, and uh, they may have some discharge as well, white blood cells in the urine, and so forth. So the etiology of nephrolithiasis, most commonly it's going to be due to a high serum calcium, as I mentioned, uh, but there are other things that can cause stones. So what we have here in red are the stones. So this is just going in order of the most common type of stone uh, to the least common types of stones. And what's in red here, these form in acidic urine. This is why you want to test the urinary pH, because if it's acidic, it points you more towards calcium oxalate stones and uric acid stones. If it's alkalotic, then it points you more towards calcium phosphate stones or a struvite stone. So we're going to talk about all four of these. Actually, we'll talk about uh, uh, cysteine stones as well. Uh, but we'll talk about uh, these calcium oxalate stones, remember, are the most common. Uh, and then uh, calcium phosphate stones and struvite stones are kind of tied per second. There are some rare types of stones, bilirubin, cholesterol, leucine, tyrosine, sulfa, acyclovir, and indinavir. These last three are caused by medications. Uh, remember, indinavir is given to patients with, H with HIV and AIDS. Uh, bilirubin stones typically uh, will form uh, in patients that have Hepatic disease, cholesterol uh, stones will typically form in patients who have nephrotic syndrome. And also, I should point out, cysteine stones are the number one cause of nephrolithiasis in children. So here's a way you can kind of uh, guess as to what the stone might be. Of course, you're always going to want to look at the urine 
under a microscope to know for sure, but this can help you. So you get a serum calcium. That's always going to be important. Get a serum calcium because if the patient has a high serum calcium, you want to look and work up for hyperparathyroidism. So if it's high, you should suspect one of the calcium stones, calcium oxalate or calcium phosphate. Remember, calcium oxalate forms in an acidic urine, calcium phosphate forms in an alkalotic urine. And you should work these patients up for hyperparathyroidism. If the serum calcium is normal, you can check the urine pH. If it's low acidic, you should consider a uric acid stone. These patients also have a tendency towards gout and malignancy. If it's high, you should consider a struvite stone, and typically that's going to be uh, some kind of an infection. That. So calcium oxalate stones are blackish, brownish, envelope-shaped crystals, and they make up the vast majority of nephrolithiasis cases. They develop in acidic urine. Hyperparathyroidism is a big cause. Hypercalcemia is a big cause. But another one you should consider is anything wrong with the small bowels. So Crohn's disease small bowel bypass surgery, any kind of rerouting of the small bowels can cause, uh, can increase the oxalate levels and predispose to calcium oxalate stones. Ethylene glycol poisoning can also cause calcium oxalate stones as well. So you can see these are envelope shaped. Like here's the top of the envelope where you close it and then here's the bottom. So these are calcium oxalate stones. So calcium phosphate stones are dirty white and porcupine shaped. They kind of look like little needles. I'll show you a picture in a little bit. They make up a lot fewer of the nephrolithiasis cases, only about 5 to 10 percent. They tend to develop in alkali urine, whereas the calcium oxalate stones tend to develop in acidic urine. Important causes here, besides hyperparathyroidism or hypercalcemia, which they do develop in those cases because these are calcium stones, is renal tubular acidosis. So remember with renal tubular acidosis, you have difficulty acidifying the urine, and so that gives you an alkali urine, and alkali urine predisposes you to calcium phosphate stones. Pretty simple. So you can see these are like sort of porcupine shape. I don't have a picture of a porcupine. I probably should have put one up here. So you can see how they're porcupine shape, but they basically look like little needles, and they're that sort of dirty white color. Struvite stones are also known as magnesium ammonium phosphate stones or triple phosphate stones. And these are uh, these only make up about 5 to 10 percent of uh, kidney stones as well. These form in an alkali urine and they also are dirty white but they are coffin shaped. Now the most prominent cause of struvite stones is a urinary tract infection with a urea splitting organism. Most commonly this is Proteus mirabilis. You should suspect struvite stones if the patient uh, already has a fever and then especially if the urinary pH is high uh, but white blood cells uh, are commonly present in urine in any nephrolithiasis so just because you have white blood cells doesn't necessarily make it a struvite stone. Uh, you're going to know the type of the stone Ultimately, I mean, I don't think you're ever going to be asked to guess what kind of stone it is based on a clinical history. However, you may be asked to determine uh, what type of stone it is based on a picture um, or possibly what's the most likely stone based on the clinical history. So struvite stones tend to develop with UTIs with Proteus mirabilis. All right, so these are coffin shaped. So they're not envelope shaped. Envelope shaped you would see sort of like an X. Let me go back to that. So you kind of see like that X there. With struvite stones, you get that long sort of line down the middle. It looks like a coffin. I should have put pictures of porcupines and coffins on here, but you can look up what a picture of a coffin looks like. It, it looks just like that. You can tell that these were uh, these names were developed by pathologists because they're always so creative. They have a tendency to like uh, food analogies, which can really gross you out when you're going through pathology, as I'm sure you know. Okay, uric acid stones uh, make up a minority, only about 5%. They tend to be yellow-brown and diamond-shaped. Uric acid stones, just as its name says, tend to uh, develop in acidic urine. 
And they are a result of high serum uric acid levels. The uric acid then gets into the urine and it has a tendency to form stones. These are associated with gout, hematologic malignancies, high protein consumption, chemotherapy, especially uh, with leukemia, and metabolic acidosis. Uric acid stones are radiolucent and they will not show up on x-ray, uh, but they will show up on CT and they may show up on renal ultrasound. So this is a uric acid stone. I'm sorry, this is the best picture I can find. Cysteine stones are a very, very small minority. However, they are disproportionately found in children. It's the most common cause of kidney stones in children. And it is caused by a genetic disorder known as cystinuria, which is autosomal recessive. Cysteine stones are typically the presenting feature, so they may not have a known history of cystinuria. Uh, usually this will present in teens or 20s, but it can certainly present earlier than that. Malodorous urine will be present with the cysteine stones. Cysteine kind of stinks, so that's why that happens. And these crystals will be hexagonal shaped, and when you see them, they're, they're very uh, conspicuous. So this is a cysteine stone. I think this is an illustration from somebody. I think I got another picture. Yeah, so here are cysteine stones. So here you have your calcium oxalate stones, envelope shape, uric acid crystals. This is a somewhat better picture. Struvite stones, which are coffin shaped, and then your cysteine crystals. So remember, calcium oxalate crystals form in uh, with a high serum calcium. Uh, and in a, an acidic urine. Uric acid crystals also have an acidic urine. Uh, struvite stones tend to form in an alkaline urine, especially in the presence of a UTI with Proteus mirabilis. Cysteine crystals happen in children with cystinuria. The treatment for any suspected nephrolithiasis, as I mentioned, the first step is going to be pain meds. IV, preferably. It works quick. You can use opioids. I would prefer opioids if it were me, but that's up to you. Uh, but just know you need to use pain meds. Acetaminophen is going to be the best if you happen to have a pregnant patient. You'll want to use acetaminophen. Remember, you want to avoid NSAIDs in pregnant patients. You want to ensure that they have adequate renal function. That's as simple as having a creatinine level, which you can include on your CMP. You want to ensure that they're adequately hydrated. So because they're often going to be in pain, sometimes they're vomiting, you, you should just give them IV hydration. You're, you're going to want to have an IV line anyway for the pain meds, so you can give them IV uh, hydration. And another reason you want, IV, or you want hydration in general, really good hydration, is because it's going to help with passing the stone too. In most cases, they will pass the stone on their own. They're not going to require surgery. CT is needed to assess the size. Remember, less than five millimeters can pass. Five to seven millimeters is kind of a window area. You won't be asked about that on the test. It'll either be definitively can pass less than five millimeters or definitively will require surgery greater than seven millimeters. If the patient has a fever or, heaven forbid, is septic, you can start antibiotics. You want to make sure that you cover gram negatives. Uh, so ampicillin gentamicin is commonly used. You get very good broad spectrum coverage with that. You can also use ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin. As I mentioned before, you want to strain the urine so you can get uh, stones, send it off to pathology if necessary if you don't have smaller stones in uh, the urinalysis. And then you can discharge them uh, once the stone is passed, pain is gone, and they don't no longer have a fever if they had one, and manage the underlying cause if there is one. Most of these are going to be idiopathic, but you do want to make sure, especially if it's a calcium stone, which remember are the most common, you want to make sure that they do not have hyperparathyroidism. You want to work that up and exclude it. This is extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. This is what's used for patients who have stones that cannot be passed greater than 7 millimeters.